You're listening to Catalyst for Change, and my name is Jessica Huckabee, your host. I started this podcast to learn what makes people resilient after challenging events and how they've used those series of events as a catalyst for change in their life. You'll hear stories of resiliency and strength, so get ready, sit back, and be prepared to be inspired. Today, my guest is Sarah Heilman. At 5'3 and 204 pounds, her weight held her back physically, mentally, and emotionally. Being labeled as clinically obese, she had anxiety, suffered from depression, went through bouts of disordered eating, and struggled with self-image on a daily basis. Today, she is 64 plus pounds lighter and healthier than ever. Her physical and mental transformation influenced her decision to become a personal trainer fitness nutrition specialist, and a health coach. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming on my podcast, Catalyst for Change Stories. And you have a wonderful story, and I would really love to hear more about it. My story kind of starts, I feel like my whole life has been a story. It really started, I guess, when I was probably 12 years old, going on 13. I was always the slightly bigger girl in class, And there was a lot of pressure coming from home, I guess you could say, in terms of looking a certain way and being a certain way and presenting the perfect picture of the perfect family, when really there was, you know, some turmoil inside the home. And I really used food to cope with emotion because I didn't know how to communicate feelings and I couldn't express feelings without them, without some opinion coming from a family member that you know, suppress them, right? I resorted to eating a lot of binge eating because I was already this kind of bigger girl. My, I remember my dad coming to me, who is a very kind man. um, And I'm sure at the time wanted just the best intentions for me. But I remember setting this new year's goal to lose 20 pounds. He's like, yeah, I love it. He's like, I'll give you a hundred dollars if you do it. And I did it and I did it in not such a great way. I would eat like an apple a day and I would restrict Mm. myself and I lost the 20 pounds. And you know, what I think he failed to see and what I think a lot of parents fail to see is, you know, as we make these strides in life, they, they can come at a cost (laughs) and sometimes they don't know the cost. They just see the result and they're like, Oh, excellent job. But it's like, okay, well, how'd you get there? (laughs) Kind of went into me getting into a phase of, dieting, I would see, I have an older sister and my mom, who is the smallest person in the house, right? (laughs) Smallest girl in the house, rather. Like I was always comparing myself to her and would watch her try on clothes in front of the mirror and talk about herself, even though she was the smallest one in the house and she was beautiful um, or is beautiful still. All of these messages of these negative messages were coming to me in terms of like, okay, well, she thinks that she's big, right? And she's the smallest one in the house. What did she think about me? Oh, yeah. So I internalized a lot of that stuff. And, you know, again, I said communication wasn't always, there was no communication in my family. It was like, okay, let's present this perfect picture to the outside world, even though there's some stuff going on inside the family. So I really turned to food for comfort. That was my outlet. That's what numb me. It's as if, uh, you know, someone who's addicted to drugs would turn to drugs. Food was my drug. I used it, but I was also this girl who wanted to look like the girl in the magazine. (laughs) So I would diet and I would restrict, but then I'd binge again and gain weight back. And it was just this total back and forth for many years. And it wasn't until, and I should say, I did deal with a lot of like depression and anxiety and things like that throughout my teenage years. And it wasn't until I was 21 years old that I decided to seek help. Um, and realized that I couldn't do it on my own anymore. I was literally falling apart. And so that's kind of the start of my story. Today, I am a personal trainer, nutrition and health coach, and I help women fall back in love with their bodies and treat their bodies with respect and nourish their bodies. And it's not focused so much on weight loss or anything like that, but just having a respect for your body and living your life to the fullest because you can. And not letting diet culture and other people's opinions of you make a difference, right? Not change your trajectory. And so that's kind of, yeah, that's my. (laughs) Interesting. So, so tell me, let's, let's rewind a little bit and tell me how you ended up getting help when you were 21, who helped you and what was that process like? 
Oh, so at the time I was um, transitioning from community college to university. And I grew up in a very small town in um, Harford County, Maryland. I was going to a college that was kind of on the outskirts of Baltimore. It was just a very different <laughs> anxiety driven change for me. Any kind of change was, um, had a lot of anxiety behind it and angst behind it. I began to live in an apartment like near the college um, that I was about to transfer to. And I was there for maybe two months. And internally I was struggling. I had a new job. <laughs> I had a new apartment that I was trying to pay for, for myself. And there were just a lot of different aspects of my world that were changing all at once. And that pressure to, you know, to succeed and to make sure that everything was perfect, it really built up, but it, it, it built up so much that it broke me down. I started engaging in you know, I had already had a binge eating disorder, which at that time I didn't really call it that, right? It was kind of here and there. Bulimia was kind of in and out of my teenage years, but okay. it really came back up and came to the surface during this transition time in my life. And it got to the point where I didn't want to be here anymore. I didn't want to live. I remember it was the day before I was supposed to <laughs> start my classes. I called my sister and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I was hysterically crying. I think I had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I don't yeah. know if that's what it was necessarily. You know, she kind of calmed me down and she's like, listen, she's like, just drop the classes. It's okay. Like I was putting all this pressure on myself, you know, to go into this university and to do well. And just things weren't going well in my life. And again, the eating disorder was coming up a lot. And she's like, it's okay. Just drop, <laughs> drop everything. It's okay. Yeah. So that's what I did. I basically put my everything on life in hold, except for working. Yeah. And, but school was on hold. Social life was on hold. All of that was on hold. And I called my doctor and I told her basically my truth that I think I have an eating disorder. Well, I knew I had an eating disorder, right? It just had never really been said out loud, I guess. And I'm like, what do I do? And so she referred me to a mental health facility, um, Shepherd Pratt, which is located in near Baltimore City. And they have a wonderful eating disorder program there. So I called there and they wanted me to do an inpatient program. And I actually ended up opting for outpatient because I, I wanted some control over, over my life. I, I had a feeling that if I went in completely, like, I, I lose all aspects of that control. And, you know, as a perfectionist, you want some control. So I'm like, okay, yeah. I'll meet you halfway. I'll do the outpatient program. And that kind of started a few years of therapy for myself. I remember first seeing the, uh, a psychologist there and she said, she, I was very hesitant to do anything at first. And she's like, you know, you've been doing it your way for so many years. She's like, it hasn't worked. It got you here. She's like, why don't you try doing it our way? That has stuck with me ever since. That's when they put me on antidepressants and I was on those for, you know, just three months. It was kind of just get out, get out of a funk. I don't want to call it a funk, but, um, you know, just to get out of that demeanor, I guess. And I started seeing a therapist once a week and, you know, throughout the years, I, I saw him for, I think two years, um, maybe a little bit over, but like we would kind of we would see each other twice a week, then it went to once a week, then it would go to like once a month. So it kind of, you know, towards the end there would become more and more rare that I would go. But it was still a point in my life where it was kind of like a check in, right? Like a maintenance program almost to make sure I was still doing okay. Yeah. But aside from the individual therapy with him, I was doing two other group theories, uh, therapies, I would go to a community group therapy every Wednesday night. Like I threw myself into recovery, so to say. That perfectionist part of you, um, I could see was, was <laughs> working to, yeah. You were like, I'm going to get this right. I'm going to do everything I can and I'm going to beat this. That's good. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I put off school for about six months, you know, six months into recovery. I was kind of at that point where it's like, okay, I can take that next step. So I re-entered school and things like that. So every, all of the pieces of my life that felt like they, uh, fell apart rather. Um, I felt like they were kind of coming together again, but in a much more natural, um, way, as opposed to me trying to like push everything and make sure everything was perfect. And, um, so that's kind of, you know, <laughs> how I saw yeah. it. Happen. Yeah. 
And now oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's so wonderful. And it, and it, I'm so glad you were able to get the help that you needed and you threw yourself into that because, and you mentioned early on that emotions and not being able to express yourself in your, in your family of origin. And, and that's, you know, that's true for, for a lot of people and, and eating problems do come up because, and as one of the symptoms of, you know, not being able to express yourself fully and that perfectionism for some people, it comes up because, you know, you want to make sure that you present in a certain light and you have to get everything right because you're external you know you want to present a good face externally and that seems like a cultural thing in america in some ways <laughs> and oh, i see that a lot i think we've come a long way and you've done a lot of work and now you're you're helping other people see that you, they don't have to keep everything in they don't have to binge eat or worry about their body it's all about being healthy not just on the inside or not just on the outside, but also on the inside. And so oh. tell, tell me how you're helping other people through that struggle that you went through. I started out. So after I would always been fairly active, right? Um, I played softball growing up and I played a little bit of soccer, became more inactive, I would say, and just would occasionally visit the gym in my later teenage years and into my early 20s. But I kind of found a love for fitness because it challenged me in a different way. And when I say fitness, I mean like weightlifting or strength training. There was a measurement to it. It wasn't like the scale, like stepping on a scale and seeing the scale go down or anything. But no, it was like, okay, I lifted this much last week. Let's see how much more I can do this week. So I really fell in love with that. And I eventually became a personal trainer. Okay. And it was kind of in personal training, you know, I would help people, I would help them lose weight. A lot of people would come to me to lose weight because I, I was 204 pounds um, at my heaviest and I'm 65 pounds down from that now. Yeah. And, you know, wow. people would come to me and they'd look at me and be like, oh, you've had such a trans uh, transformation in your own life. Like, I want that. And, you know, I would help them with working out and we would monitor nutrition. But what I found at the end of the day, you know, after they stopped coming to me, you know, after they had had their res gotten to their um, their goal weight or whatever it was, they would leave and then they'd come back six months, nine months later, having gained all of it back. So there were no real habits that were formed. They may have still been working out, but the nutrition, something else was there with the nutrition. So what I do today, um, I founded my business called Strong Bold Healthy. It's basically helping primarily women. I help some men, but primarily women um, focus on their habits, their daily habits. Because when we can change something small in every day and we can do it consistently that's how real change is made it's not these big grand gestures right it's it comes down to these small daily things that you can do that are going to make the biggest difference in your life and yeah. so that's what I help them do so yeah some of it is fitness some of it is nutrition but a lot of it is in those daily habits and just adding to your life as opposed to taking away so instead of saying oh let's let's cut back on all of the junk food, just remove it from your life. That's not realistic, right? <laughs> Instead, we're like, okay, well, you're only having maybe one vegetable every other day. Let's try to get a vegetable every day Do that for a few weeks. And then it's like, okay, well, let's add in another vegetable every single day. So, you know, it's about these, again, small changes that you can build up over time. And that's how, you know, people come to me, they're like, well, how did you manage to lose 65 pounds and then maintain it. And it's like, well, I worked really hard. <laughs> I stayed disciplined. It was like two steps forward, one step back every step of the way, but it was in those small daily habits and changes okay. that made all the difference. What was the challenging part? What was the most challenging part of the journey that you had? I think actually getting help right? Is that, is that the, uh, yeah. the journey that you're referring to or like yeah. there are different aspects to it? I right? know you have a, you have a really interesting story <laughs> and yeah. So getting help. So getting help was, yeah, I think really actually asking for help. And I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. You know, we kind of go through the motions of the day without actually stopping and thinking like, am I happy? Do I like what I'm doing? Or am I just kind of on autopilot yeah. and, you know, 
a lot of people, especially when it comes to food, we just naturally will grab something like if it's a donut or something just sitting there just because it's there, right? We might not even yeah. be hungry, but it's just there. So it's like, oh, I sure I'll have it. Um, but it's becoming like more mindful. And I think that initial step of acknowledging, okay, there's an issue or there's a problem, which I, you know, I knew there was a problem, but it was one of these problems that was very secretive binge eating is very secretive. Yeah. It's, um, it's a very lonely journey. You don't want other people to know like, oh yeah, I binge eat. There's bulimia involved, right? It's just not a pretty, <laughs> it's not a pretty picture. At the end of the day, I knew that if I had continued down that road, I wasn't going to live very long. And I was just sick and tired of that. So, you know, I think just having the, the courage to ask for help. That takes um, a lot of strength. I mean, oh, absolutely. that is just amazing that you were able to ask for help. A lot of people it's, it is very difficult. And just to have that amount of strength that that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that is, that is really scary taking that first step. And it sounds like you just threw yourself all the way into it, which is just even more amazing than just asking for help. You just went all in. I did. Yeah. I, I felt like I didn't really have, I have, you always have a choice, right? Um, at the end of the day, it was kind of, again, I was in that all or nothing mindset too. That's kind of how diet culture works. At the same time, it was a good all or nothing because, you know, had I not sought help, I would still be dealing with those issues. I would not be helping women today. I'd be still stuck in my own little world, depressed, anxiety driven, it would not, it would not look pretty. <laughs> and it sounds like you're healthy on the inside and the outside and you're helping other people. So you're paying it forward. And it's really, that is really amazing. Now, what is the biggest challenge of helping other people get healthy? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. That must be challenge, have its own set of challenges for you. It does. It does. I think a lot of the people who come to me well, some of them, I should say, have come in with a diet mentality sense of, you know, like, oh, I, I don't eat carbs. I don't do this. I want a high protein diet. And I'm like, okay, that's okay. But at the same time, your body needs carbohydrates, right? Yeah. We have all this fluff and diet rules and things like that. So I think getting rid of those, my, you know, my clients actually trusting themselves. So it's about building confidence and having yeah, about trusting yourself and, you know, knowing like, okay, you can't do the right things and get the wrong results. So if you've been doing all these things, and it was kind of like my, the psychologist saying to me, right, you've done it your way for so long, and it hasn't worked, it led you here so much. Trouble. Yeah. So, so getting them off that track of they, you know, the low carb or the high protein, getting them onto like a, a different mindset, as far as the absolutely. diet culture. Yeah. Changing the mindset yeah. not only behind their, um, you know, their views on food and what the media has been pushing their way or the diet industry has been pushing their way, trying to get them away from that, or even friends pushing them that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, but so changing that mentality, but also changing the mentality they have about themselves, because a lot of women, especially who come to me, they're very low on themselves and they don't give themselves credit a lot of the time. So it's about helping them recognize, recognize their strengths and what they've, what has gone well, as opposed to focusing on what hasn't gone well. Yeah. So each time I have a session with someone, I'm like, what were your wins from this week? And, you know, a lot of times they'll be like, oh, I don't feel like I had any. And then we'll kind of dig deeper into the session. And they're like, oh, I did go on a walk for one mile, but it wasn't the two miles that I usually do. So it's like that word, but kind of negates yeah. everything they just said. And it's like, cause they're focused on, oh, I didn't do as, as much as what I usually do. So then yeah. they don't give themselves credit. So my job is to help bring out their wins and to help them focus more on the positive aspects of their journey, as opposed to getting stuck in the rut of what didn't go right. Nothing will ever be perfection, right? It's yeah. the journey of progression. So, and that's my goal to get them to that point of, um, of realizing that. Oh, that's really important. The mindset, the mental health aspect of of life, of getting healthy. It's, it is really, there's a lot of psychology behind it. And oh, absolutely. yeah, you brought up a really good point and keeping track of those wins. You must have them keep track of, keep records of things like what they eat and how many vegetables. And it sounds like from what you're saying, that really helps people keep track of things. 
yeah, and the I wins think, that they have. Yeah, I think in terms of nutritionally, everyone is different. Um, yeah. So, you know, you kind of give them basic guidelines and it's like, okay, here are the amount of, you know, fruit servings or vegetable servings you should aim for each day. If you get close, great. If not, that's okay. Because if as long as it was better than yesterday yeah. or last week, then you're on the right track. Um, again, it's about those small changes. But yeah, it's about giving them kind of a, taking away all the rules that they think they should follow and taking the shoulds out of it and the rules out of it. And it just, it's a very freeing experience. I think yeah. for a lot of them, scary, but freeing. It's kind of like me asking for help. Right? Yeah. Like, um, it's very scary to start, but it's also very freeing once I get the, once I got the ball rolling. Yeah, no, that's so important. And I like the way that you go about your business and helping people. It's just really amazing and bringing out their strengths and what they're doing right is really important. Well, what do you do to stay positive in your life daily? Is there a, a routine that you do to stay in a good, good mindset? Yeah. So I don't have anything <laughs> down packed, yeah. but you know, I think again, there are small things that I've added to my day to day that help. I can tell you working out again, that is not only a stress reliever for me most days, some days I don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of my break in the, in the middle of the day, I'll go and work out. And during that time, if it's a cardio session, I'll watch like my favorite show. So it just brings me joy. I've learned to kind of pair some tedious tasks. Like if it's working out and I don't feel like doing it, it's like, well, guess what, Sarah, you can watch a show while you're doing it. So it, it makes it yeah. fun and enjoyable. I try to plan my meals ahead of time. Okay. I found that that has helped me immensely. Um, I'm the type of person, if nothing's prepared, then I'll kind of eat a little bit of everything and it doesn't feel like I've had a full meal. Yeah. So then it's like, okay, even though I'm not hungry, once I do prepare a meal, I'll still eat it. So I know that about myself. So what I do ahead of time is I'll either, you know, roast some vegetables just to have on hand to eat so that I'm not like digging in a, you know, a nut jar or something like that. Not that nuts are unhealthy, but they aren't as nutrient dense as a vegetable would be. So yeah. they're very calorically dense. So I would say working out, getting any kind of activity in, whether it's going for a walk and just taking care of yourself physically in that way, preparing meals ahead of time, or if I don't have time to pre prepare meals ahead of time, then I will write out a meal plan just so I have an idea going into each day like, oh, okay, I'll have avocado toast for breakfast or something like that. I'll have yeah. soup for lunch. Just taking time to, I guess, from an emotional standpoint, uh, taking time for self-care. So whether that's, you know, diving into a new book, because that's what relaxes me and kind of gets my mind off of work and things like that, or the stressors of my life. I think making time for that is super valuable. And I think it helps play out you know, everything else. Um, it doesn't make everything else seem so overwhelming when yeah. you're taking care of yourself first. Oh yeah. That's so important. Well, wonderful. Those are great habits. And I really like how you're helping other people because of your journey. You're, you're who you are right now and helping others because of the things that you've went through. Yeah. And I like how you use that pain, that challenge as a catalyst for change in your life. And I just really appreciate you telling us your story. I know the listeners are really going to love hearing about it. And I'm going to have all of your information in our show notes. Yeah, thank you. You've been listening to Catalyst for Change, and my name is Jessica Huckabay, your host. Join us next week for another story of resiliency. And please subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And feel free to leave me a comment or email me at catalystforchange20 at gmail.com. Or on Facebook, we have a page at Catalyst for Change Resiliency.